Hello and welcome to the second hour of Sunday with Michael Portillo. Cozy yourself on this wintry afternoon with a warming broth of arts, culture and good debate. Prime Minister Rishi Sunak claimed a diplomatic coup this week with his AI summit in London, at which for the first time tech companies agreed to allow governments to vet their artificial intelligence software. But did the summit leave the government officials more or less concerned about the potential of AI and its potential impact. I'll debate that with two experts. Thank you, Sophia Wensler. The Prime Minister was perhaps in his natural habitat this week, mingling among the elite of Silicon Valley as he hosted a summit about the future of artificial intelligence. Rishi Sunak has sought to position Britain as a leader in the development and the regulation of AI, and he won a victory with the agreement by major tech firms like Google to allow governments to test their AI products before they're released to the public. What has the summit taught us about a future with artificial intelligence? Do we have cause to fear? To answer that question, I'm joined by two futurists. Andrew Eborn is with me here in the studio, while Rohit Talwa joins us from Thailand. And welcome to you both. Um, Andrew, let me start with you um, and ask, was Elon Musk right to say that we should look forward to a world where there aren't jobs. I think he was right. And I'll tell you what, it's one extension from what Goldman Sachs said. They said 300 million jobs are going to be lost. But we have to put that in context. Uh, I always say that uh, artificial intelligence is perhaps our greatest human achievement, but potentially the biggest existential threat. And what we need to do is put a bit of insight. We need to look at what the actual threats are, what it can achieve, and put sort of regulations and some sort of security, which is Rishi, to his testament, uh, absolutely wants to put the UK front and centre of that. But the other reality, Michael, is that the jobs that we have today, 60% of those, weren't around 40 years ago. So what Elon's message, and it's been slightly misinterpreted by the press, it was actually a positive message about a time of abundance, where you don't have to work, is what he was saying, but you can if you want to. And what's going to happen is, rather than being a minimum wage, he was saying, well, actually, we're going to have a, a higher wage for everybody uh, on that sort of basis. Very often in our history, we have thought that a new technology was going to do away with jobs because we had not been able to foresee the new jobs that would be available. Do you believe that this is unlike anything that's ever happened in history? I think it's probably the most disruptive time ever in history because what AI can do, it can do virtually everything. On the positive side, we found cures for diseases which we never thought possible. On the creative side, you know, it's front and centre of the Hollywood strike for actors. The, the writer's one has been settled. But basically, you can do a one day's filming and use an actor forever, their digital recreation. Uh, and we had a positive thing, uh, Bruce Willis, who has aphasia, uh, he could no longer act. But he licensed his name, image and voice for a Russian telecom company for millions of dollars. And they recreated him in an advertisement using AI. So it's understanding that technology. What we need to do is put the commercial reality in there. As you know, I speak around the world on AI, but I'm also an intellectual property lawyer. And it's that sort of balance between preserving the rights of those who are creators with the, the, the sort of technology to make sure that that catches up. Um, let's uh, get another view. Um, Rohit, I hope uh, you're there. Welcome again to GB News. Uh, Rohit, could you tell us uh, your idea about what dangers might be represented by AI? Or, or maybe you think they're exaggerated? No, they're not exaggerated, but we're at such an early stage in the evolution of AI that it's very hard to know exactly what the risks will be. And there's, there's two types of risks. One is humans misusing the technology and history tells us that that happens every time we as well as all the benefits of the internet and social media we know they've been used for malicious intent as well and we can assume uh, with pretty much 100 percent certainty that people will want to use ai with malign intent but the second is this idea that someday we might get to what's called artificial general intelligence which is what elon musk was alluding to where the technology will be as smart as humans in every dim dimension and will actually be thinking for itself. And at that point, we don't know how it will look at humanity. We don't know whether it will choose to make decisions that are harmful to humanity. So that's all on the horizon. It was a good start this week. 
where we talked about some of the existential risks, it, I think some of the things lack a bit of substance, like the idea that with the trillions of dollars that Amazon and Google and others have poured into AI, somehow governments will be able to really effectively test that. I think you will need super smart AI to test this AI, and uh, our government doesn't have that. No government has that as yet. And the second part is there were a lot of very fine words about risks and the need to evaluate risks more and to look at where we could do things in regulation and to collaborate where possible. But there was no real concrete action uh, in the same way as we have um, global agreements on things like nuclear weapons and cloning. We need some sort of agency globally that's going to guide this. And there was a, a walking away from that this week because every country involved sees a massive competitive opportunity with AI. And so no one is going to vote to restrict it in the short term. Um, Rohit, um, I, don't, I don't personally have a great deal of faith in government regulation. You've made the comparison there with uh, nuclear weapons. And it's true that we've gone through a very long period in which they've not been used. Although probably I would argue that it has been mutually assured destruction, which has probably been the biggest factor there. Obviously, there have been safeguards like hotlines put in between the Kremlin and Washington and so on. Uh, is there really any hope that governments could regulate AI with the extent of the threat that you've already described? I think trying to catch up with the tech is going to be hard. But the good thing is, unlike the internet and social media, where we're always trying to regulate after the effect and, and not being able to really deal with it effectively. I think now we have the chance to regulate in advance and to think about not every possible outcome, but certainly in terms of the way it's used and a number of aspects of AI, we could do some reasonable regulation and then evolve that over time as the technology evolves. So we're not going to make it perfect, but I think we could do a lot. And if Rishi wants the UK to be at the lead, in the lead of this, then A, we're playing catch up with you, which already has an AI Act. But B, we need to start doing something tangible that shows that in law, we're putting in place protections. And I think the big protections that we really want right now are around you and me and our use and, and the use of our data and securing both who can access our data and then how they can use it using AI. And I think that's an area where we could do a lot right now. And it doesn't matter how the AI evolves. If we put those protections in place, society will feel a lot more comfortable about AI going forward. That's a really useful, concrete example. Uh, Andrew, you, you, you've talked cheerfully about yes. this world without jobs, without work. I'm one of those people who rather defines myself by what I do. You're going to need a lot of change in human beings, I think, I, to adapt to that world. You're absolutely right. Both Elon and Rishi said you need to have a purpose in life, which is why they're saying you, need, you can have a job if you want to. So the question is what sort of job you would have. Uh, and that's the thing. When people retire, sadly, the mortality rate goes very quickly, doesn't it? Because you need to have that purpose. So uh, Rishi, very positively, said, look, look at AI as a co-pilot with what you do. It, it makes your work a lot easier. It gets rid of the mundane task and makes you more efficient as an individual. Um, and it's quite amusing. There was a cartoon, a uh, Matt cartoon, um, just in uh, just yesterday. It was uh, when, when you're older, what job do you want AI to do for you? I think it worked on that sort of basis. But that's the reality. If get rid of the mundane jobs, and we can do much more exciting things on that sort of basis. And I think that's right. What, what we were saying beforehand is let's look at how we might regulate it, but deal with. We're living in a very diseased information world at the moment, and there's a number of examples of the Slovakia election and what happened. There was a, a fake audio recording that was out from one of the candidates. And it may have influenced the election that they'd lost as a result of it. And Rishi mentioned um, basically about uh, elections, obviously, in, in the US, in India, in Indonesia, and possibly the UK, he said, uh, next year. And they're very concerned about the spread of disinformation and using AI on that sort of basis. So we need control. We need to make sure that we can work out what those risks are. And to basically, as, as Elon said, it's insight before oversight.
And where does all the money come from, Andrew? You said it wouldn't be minimum wage. People would be getting a lot of money. How? Where does the money come from? Well, it's a difference. You go back to the days of bartering, aren't you? So if, if you solve all sorts of things like crop problems and you solve, uh, I don't know, weather, all these sort of things, which they've suggested, AI could be brilliant at doing. You solve diseases. You have massive expenses on that sort of basis. Then that's what happens. That'd be a different sort of economy, I guess. Sounds a little bit like fool, fool's gold to me, but uh, we shall see, or maybe I won't see, but others will. Thank you to Andrew Ebon and Rohit Talwar.